<laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It's given me all kinds of warnings. The content of this meeting is being sent to a third party. <laughs> you are live. We are all live now. Um, and dun, dun, dun. okay. Welcome, everyone, to Outspoken, the Publishing Triangle's reading series, monthly reading series, and this is the March edition, as it is March. Yes, to March. <laughs> uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder, along with my partner, Donnie Jokum, of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. Tonight, we're being helped by our volunteer, Kevin, the Bureau is an all-volunteer organization, so volunteers, donations, and sales are how we keep this boat afloat. So we do have a suggested donation of $10, but most of you are readers, or many of you are readers, so I'd hate for you to have to donate when you're reading. But if you feel like it, if you feel so compelled, we will accept your donation. Um, another great way to support us is to, of course, buy books. So I will leave that up to you, but I'll pass this around. You can also make a donation via Venmo at BGSQD. Those are the five letters all around you. And as Rob is usually the one to tell you, but I feel like I should, since it is the organization that I founded. <laughs> you can also donate monthly, regularly, if you go to our website, bgsqd.com, go to the menu and click on donate. You can sign up to make a monthly donation of one dollar five dollars ten dollars there are people in this room who do this carol and rob thank you um and that is really great for us because then we know we have a reliable uh, source of income whichever way you're able to support us we appreciate and if you're not already on our email list and you would like to be you can sign up for that at the back of the room or on our website which is bgsqd.com and, oh, Jerry, let's let Jerry back in. I hope I didn't knock him off. All right. Uh, before I hand it over to Rob, I want to read a land acknowledgement and a call for a ceasefire. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Munsi Lenape. We encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community Houses Manhattan Fund. The Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manhattanfund.org. We also want to recognize that today, March 13th, is the 159th day of Israel's genocidal campaign against the Palestinian people, funded by our tax dollars and enabled by our government's unwavering support. We hope that you will join us in calling for an immediate permanent ceasefire, an end to the siege, and an end to the occupation in order to stop the collective punishment of Palestinians and to ensure the swift delivery of much needed food, water, medicine, fuel, and medical aid to the people of Gaza. And we are now selling these lovely ACT UP Palestine t-shirts, which you can purchase up front, and we are not taking a cut. So the money goes to ACT UP, and 50% of that goes to Palestinian organizations. Uh, that's all the announcements for me. I'm going to turn it over to Rob, and we're going to jump right into this reading. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, well, we've been doing this for almost a year and I'm still messed up with it. Um, before we get going, um, I want to uh, thank again the Bureau for hosting us uh, since we've been doing these since October. In fact, sometimes twice a month. <clears throat> and we hope to keep the series going for a long, long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, it is a great way to bring queer writers to queer audiences uh, and sell books, not coincidentally. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you, Greg. I'm Rob Burns with the Publishing Triangle. Um, oh, one thing before we start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurry favor with people. Um, tomorrow, and I can say this uh, here because my partner, we have a division in our life. He doesn't want to hear any shit about the book stuff. So <laughs> he's like, not, nah, he's watching, he's he's at home right now watching, you know, Golden Girls or <laughs> something. And, uh, but tomorrow is our 21st anniversary. Oh, so, no. and I, 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 yeah, I know, I, I would ruin the surprise otherwise, but I only mention this because I stopped on my way here at, 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 at Lauterbach, um, uh, Lauterbach, uh, Chocolatiers on Lexington Avenue to buy some um, chocolates. Uh, no card, because I wasn't thinking that far in advance. <laughs> but as long as I was there, I was like, well, I'll get some chocolates for everyone here. So we can just pass these around. Oh, that's so sweet. In celebration of your um, yes. happy anniversary to us. Everybody, I, and I know Steve and Greco is going to be tempted to take like five, but no, 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 just one. And actually, we're not, it's a decent crowd. It's not huge, though. So uh, I think tonight there'll be more than enough for, you know, everyone can have at least one. Anyway, speaking of Steve and Greco, mm -hmm. um, Steve's uh, 2014 novel Now and Yesterday, published by Kensington, which used to publish to me before they fired me. <laughs> but it was featured in Vanity Fair and praised by Kirkus as a book about a big ideas, a life-affirming yet melancholy John O'Hara-like analysis of post-baby boom meets millennial queer Big Apple Society. Steve returned to Big Apple Society <laughs> quite recently, last year, uh, when his book was also from Kensington, was published um, Such Good Friends, a novel of Truman Capote and, and Lee Radswell. And no doubt he um, probably had no objection to Ryan Murphy's latest edition of Feud coming out, coincidental to his book. Um, we I know we don't write with advanced knowledge of what pop culture is going to do, but you know, when it, it works in our favor, we're there, right? Yeah. Okay. Please welcome Stephen Greco. Oh, I'm sorry. I should add one more thing. Among his many other accomplishments out there, he is also the chair of the Farrell Grumley Foundation, which has been a partner with the Publishing Triangle for decades to give probably the most, I, I think you'll agree, the most prestigious LGBTQ plus award in uh, in gay fic, in, well, in fiction. Sorry, <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's it's an LGBTQ, LGBTQ just for gay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, thank you and welcome, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> the prestige, the prestige comes, by the way, from the amazing work that we get every year from authors, it never fails to knock me out. This year we had almost twice as many um, submissions than we've had in the past. And obviously each year the purview gets broader, the language gets more creative. It's amazing, it's really thrilling. So when you see the finalists by each and every one of their books, um, this is just a short excerpt from something that's not nearly so consequential. Thank you. Um, this is the main character in this book is a, a cook house of this book is a cook housekeeper who works for Lee Radziwill, who through Lee lear, uh, meets Truman and be, establishes a friendship with him and learns a little bit about writing from him. And uh, she was invited in this book to Truman's ball, as many uh, as, uh, common people were in addition to all the celebrities that we know went. Truman invited some of the jurors from Kansas, from the clutter trial, etc. And, and his doorman. 
there had been resistance to Truman's stag only ball invitation strategy, especially from the ladies who were not used to attending big affairs without a husband or favored escort at their side. One lady told Truman, I'm not going to get dressed up and put on a mask only to arrive alone. So Truman had arranged for several small parties to be given beforehand so guests could arrive at the ball in groups. The choice of Kat Catherine Graham as guest of honor was hailed as masterful since she wasn't central to Truman's New York social orbit as the Swans were, um, yet she was powerful and well-connected. You may remember she's the publisher of the Washington Post. Um, she's been elevated to honorary swanhood, says one of the many newspaper articles about, in quotes, the party of the century. Years later, remembering the evening, Lee told me that she had indeed hoped for a while to be Truman's guest of honor, admitting that she wanted to cement her victory over Babe Paley as head swan. She laughed as she recalled this venal desire and said she'd always nonetheless understood the strategic importance of oops, Truman's putting a non-New Yorker like Mrs. Graham on the throne. Early on the evening of the ball, before converging on the grand ballroom of the Plaza Hotel, Lee, Truman, and I were in three different locations, each of us on our own trajectory. Lee, after coming home that afternoon from Kenneth's, the hairdresser, uh, which was so busy that day, you wouldn't believe, um, and dread dressing early, went off with Stash, her husband, to the Paley's place for one of the 18 pre-parties that Truman had more or less ordered his friends to host. Truman, whose apartment was in the same building, after all, as Kay Graham's New York pied a terre, looked in at the Paley's with Mrs. Graham, then dashed with her over to the suite at the plaza that he booked to make the evening as comfortable as possible for her and to give them a quiet place for a drink and a box dinner ordered from 21 before going downstairs. Well, that should have been two sentences. Yeah. Um, and I was at Lee's apartment putting myself together in a long plain black dress that I'd found on sale in Bloomingdale's, which I accessorized with a pair of diamond stud earrings that Lee had been kind enough to lend me. Built in 1905 in the French Renaissance style, the 20... One story plaza hotel anchors the southeastern corner of Central Park on Fifth Avenue and 59th Street on majestically broad Grand Army Plaza. Since opening in 1921, the hotel's grand ballroom has been a magnet for New York's social elite, site of that of the city's most exclusive receptions, benefits, and debutante cotillions. The design and proportions of the white and gold room hum with neoclassical uh, elegance. Bordered in round arched colonnades of fluted double story icon ionic co co columns, hung with two massive crystal chandeliers and graced with all manner of painted cherubs, sculpted garlands, glittering mirrors, and gilded sconces. The ballroom is perhaps New York's most sanctified non-religious space, a high altar for those in the city devoted to the ritual enjoyment of wealth and privilege. The evening was cold and rainy. From the back of my cab, I saw that even from a block away, that traffic at the intersection of 50th, 5th and 59th was tied up. Leaving the cab curb uh, at the curb of 5th, near the fountains in front of the hotel, I found I had to make my way through police barricades, holding back the exuberant throng of paparazzi, te television cameramen, and umbrella-toting spectators, eager to catch a glimpse of some of the celebrity guests who'd been mentioned uh, in the press, a carefully curated mix of the 20th century's most influential who's who's. And then I give a little list, let's skip that. Mm -hmm. um, including, you know, fancy people. Uh, the ball was described, the ball was described by someone as a tour de force of social engineering. And more than one commentator pointedly mentioned that only months before a rally of 200,000 activists had taken place right across the street in Central Park to protest America's involvement in Vietnam. Judy, her best friend, had been so envious that I was going, can you get me in? Invitation only, it's very exclusive, you know. I just had to ask, John, her husband, um, told me Andy Warhol is going. Of course he's going. What are you wearing? Black. Mask? Five and 10. Hair? I don't know, up, back. I presented my admission card, which read Mr. Capote's Dance, checked my coat and donned my mask, a simple black sequin domino type masquerade uh, number. 
mounting the broad staircase to the ballroom's palatial foyer, I heard the lush sound of Peter Duchin's orchestra playing inside from the ballroom stage. I have dreamed from the king and I. Within minutes, I had entered the ballroom, accepted a flute of champagne, and was taking an initial stroll around, admiring the gowns and masks and the elaborate headdresses. Some of the men had pushed up or taken off their masks, but it looked to me like the women were taking the idea of disguise very seriously and were enjoying the game of perhaps not being immediately identifiable. The crowd was not too dense, allowing a proper amount of space for pope posing and preening. Truman had invited four, 540 people, and I guess that the ballroom could accommodate twice that amount. The mood was unmistakably elevated. What, with, uh, uh, what is, uh, which is what every host uh, wants for a party. But with this get, but this get gathering glowed with the added sheen of legend in the making. Smiles radiated self-congratulations as the status of world's most fabulous had officially been conferred by superstar author Truman Capote on every single person in attendance. I spotted Truman at the head of the receding line alongside a very regal Mrs. Graham in a white cassock trimmed with black beads that Lee told me later was Balmat. When it was my turn, a foursome glided away and Truman instantly recognized me despite my mask and the fact that I had put my hair up in a chignon for the first time in years. Good evening, Marlena, he said warmly. <laughs> he was wearing a new Dunhill tuxedo that he'd had made specially for the occasion. Kay, this is a great friend of mine, Marlena X. Her identity will be revealed anon, I trust. Marlena, this is Ka Catherine Graham. It's a pleasure. I said. Mrs. Graham said hello and extended her hand graciously and then turned to greet the gentleman in back of me, author Ralph Ellison. Before Truman turned to Ellison too, he squeezed my arm. Thanks for coming, he said. You look spectacular. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Greco, thank you. Um, and I, I was remiss uh, at the beginning. I should have announced that uh, one of our scheduled readers, Wo Chan, will be unable to join us tonight, uh, but we're going to reschedule them uh, for the future. I also, you know what? I do this all the time. That's a good thing, too. <laughs> Um, I bring this book up because it's a good visual to note that Kate Rounds, who's read here, is a member of the Publishing Triangle. Being a member of the Publishing Triangle only costs $40 a year, and it helps us help the, the queer publishing community. So if you can give us your $40, we'd be very grateful. If you can't, we will still be in touch, believe me. You'll hear from us so much. <laughs> I heard we sent out our bulletin, a bulletin on Monday, first one since December 1st, because, you know, people get busy. And um, we wanted to promote this reading and other things coming up. And uh, one of the, someone, someone, someone actually unsubscribed and they said they get too many bulletins from us. I'm like, oh, it's been almost four months. I, <laughs> Don't know. They're probably confusing us with the Democratic nation. <laughs> so yes, please join us. And by the way, I, I I should add too that the Publishing Triangle is a is an all volunteer organization. We have no paid staff. I'm not going to put too much of an emphasis on that, except for I'll probably mention it four more times. But, <laughs> but um, we we are. We are working our day jobs and then we are rolling up our sleeves and working for the Publishing Triangle. So I need to acknowledge that we have our board chair, Carol Rosenfeld, is here tonight. Yeah. And we have two of our board members, Jim Berg and our newest board member, Joe Okonkwo, who are here also. So welcome. Uh, and uh, it's, I, I didn't miss anyone. 
Yeah, but it's not bad. I mean, there are like nine of us, I think, right now that are, along with Steve Greco, who is sort of our, you know, adopted child during the <laughs> award season, who are doing all of this. So if you can join for $40 and help them and be a member, um, it, it's greatly appreciated. Our next reader, Mary Burns, is a longtime resident of New York City, where she lives with her wife of 20 plus years. She received a Master of Fine Arts in Playwriting from Columbia University in 1991. And her novel, Cold Case Heat, which I really love, so it was wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Um, but she'll be reading from that tonight. It's her third novel. Uh, and she uh, published with Bold Stroke Books, um, who had the good sense of picking me up at her Kensington. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that was also another uh, 12 years ago, so I probably shouldn't even go there, right? But um, anyway, Mary's um, with Bold Stroke Books now. It's based on the murder of a friend of hers. And you can re reach her website at marypburns.com. Please welcome... Mary Burns. Thank you. You need to you need to publish again. Rob, you need to publish again. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> okay, I'm glad you brought the other book up because it reminded me that I needed to bring up this is what oops. There we go. That's what the cover looks like. Um, I'll put that there for a second more. Um, I hated the cover when it first came in because I wasn't sure about the pea green and gray, but I had asked them to please put a heart with New York City in it and blood. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they captured it. So now I love the cover. Um, so uh, as Rob mentioned, the, the book is based on the murder of a friend of mine in 1981. Um, because of a number of circumstances, chief among them that, that Gary was gay and had picked up a stranger in a bar that night, the cops didn't want to work too hard to solve the murder. It was never solved. In addition, we found out shortly after he died that he'd been embezzling from his employer, uh, but that was covered up by the powers that be. Uh, when you work at a private Catholic girls' school, they're pretty good at uh, <laughs> covering that sort of thing up with the people on their board who are people in high places. Um, but it didn't, it didn't honestly, it didn't take us long to piece together what probably happened uh, because Gary uh, was having an affair with one of those male board members. Um, and we rather thought he was involved in the embezzlement, but we still could not get the police to really do the job they should have done. So with this novel, I really tried to write all those wrongs. Um, let's see, uh, it's, I'm gonna read from chapter one um, but what happens after chapter one is that Sydney gets a, Sydney Hansen, the main character, gets a threatening note reminding her that she needs to be silent still 40 years later. And this time she goes to the police. She's not the first time. Uh, and she meets Detective Gail Sterling. Um, eventually down the road, there is a, a slow burning romance. And in the meantime, uh, a lot of things are uncovered that should have been uncovered 40 years ago. But prior to that, she needs to make amends to uh, Wyatt's son. Wyatt was her friend who was murdered in the book. Wyatt discovers a notebook in his grandfather's house when he's cleaning it out after he dies during the COVID era. And in the notebook, he finds out that his father was murdered. He, he never knew that. So he comes to confront Sid, and she, in turn, decides she needs to confront someone involved in the murder. Sydney Hansen walked across the lobby that was carpeted in a rich Williamsburg blue. Her chest was thrumming with panic as she passed a rosewood art deco table with ebony inlay, the brilliant era cut glass vase on it holding bright yellow winter jasmine and broad leafed greens. Numbers based on the lobby decor alone clicked through her brain, a habit of years of accountants training which had taught her to measure and weigh the value of everything from stock offerings to new office furniture to human lives. Shutting it down, she rapped on the door of 105 and opened it. The room was dark, all the curtains closed. Sid needed a moment to adjust. Then she saw him in the wingback chair. 
Little about him seemed to have changed, except that the curly puffs of dark hair had gone white. He still bore that peculiar tilt of the head. Those big square black framed glasses he'd long favored were present. The way they magnified his dark eyes had always made him had always made them seem like two giant TV cameras following her around. She opened the curtains. The radio played his beloved opera music at a low volume. Sid turned it off as he blinked up at her, fighting the sunlight that filled the room. It was it revealed that he was an old man and frail. A fragile, lanky doll tucked beneath the plaid wool blanket that bound his legs. Those long legs, that tall frame. Once upon a time, he'd menaced her with his size. She shook a little at the memory as she looked into the eyes that had pinned her so coldly back then. Now they were confused, roomy. She sat on a beige button chair and regarded him. A bit of spittle oozed out the corner of his mouth. You don't know who I am. His gaze was blank. They say our eyes never change. Neither does our voice. He searched her face. My hair may be white now, but 40 years ago it was blonde. Recognition dawned in his eyes. And I worked at the Academy of the Divine Heart. Sid watched fear creep across his face. That's right. Wyatt Reed's junior accountant, Sidney Hansen. His hands moved beneath the blanket. I haven't forgotten any of it, and neither have you. He opened and closed his mouth, the fish out of water, no sound coming out. You made my life a living hell after Wyatt's death. You terrified me with your veiled threat, made me feel you'd always be watching me, that you might kill you that you might kill his son Drew or me. The old man strained to hear her. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. I thought I might go mad. I had no one to talk to but Marie and Nicholas, and Marie finally left me because I couldn't function. Nicholas committed suicide a year later, but you knew that, didn't you? He slumped in his chair, his face draining of color. I didn't go mad. I just lived, quietly. But now I'm angry, because last November, Wyatt's father died. Complications from COVID. You remember Joe, don't you? He certainly remembered you all these years. The loss of a son and the people involved in that loss are not something you forget. The old man raised his eyes to her imploringly. I kept in touch with Joe. She leaned forward. I went to Nebraska to see Drew quite often. And he came to New York every summer like he did when Wyatt was alive for those summers at the house on Fire Island. Wyatt gave it to me for just that purpose. But you knew all that too, because it was in the will that you and his attorney tried unsuccessfully to change. He closed his eyes for a moment. I kept looking over my shoulder for you, but you never came. You were confident that you'd gotten away with it, weren't you? The old man blinked and his mouth opened again. You know what? You did. And your threat, it stayed with me. So did Joe's advice not to go to the police about you. We didn't dare challenge that you might hurt Drew, but Drew grew up. He found out about you. That's why I'm here. We never told him that Wyatt was murdered, but he came across a notebook Joe kept all through the police investigation, such as it was. Sid looked out at the sound. Just never got over, Joe never got over Wyatt's death, you know. Her voice softened. Joe had been more of a father to her than her own cold Nordic parent, and she missed him terribly. One of the old man's hands crept above the blanket, coming to rest on the arm of the chair, and gripped the carved wooden handle. Drew confronted me with that notebook, and his anger at finding out his father was murdered brought everything up again. The loss, the pain, all of it. How could I tell him that someone had threatened him through me so that I wouldn't talk? You should have been smart enough to know you didn't have anything to back up. Excuse me. I should have been smart enough to know that you didn't have anything to back up your threat. You were never anything more than a paper tiger. Sid stood and began pacing. I was too young to see that. Then. She wanted to sit still and keep him in her crosshairs, but her anger was boiling over and she refused to let him see that. There's no one left in your life, is there? And you're on death's doorstep. She, st she stopped in front of him. You should have succumbed to COVID, you bastard, not Joe. For a second, he cringed, but, when he, but then he looked up at her as if he knew he shouldn't take his eyes off her. So I'm finally going to do what I think Wyatt was about to do all those years ago. I'm going to the police with every last shred of evidence I have, I, I have so you can't threaten me or anyone else I love ever again. 
I'm going to see to it that you're ruined before you die. But all of this, she gestured around the little apartment and out the big picture window at the sunsplash sound, is gone. But you have nothing left when they lower you into the ground, not even your sterling reputation. And we both know how tarnished that should be. Sid wanted to feel bad for making a 95-year-old man cry. He'd been the root of so many of her tears 40 years ago, but she couldn't. She handed him a tissue so he could catch the snot running out of his nose. I understand no one visits you here. You might as well be dead already, but I'll bury you before you are. Sid leaned down, her hands on either arm of the chair, her face an inch from his, and you can take that to the bank. His little mewling sounds stirred something deep within her, and for a moment, it was herself she heard as she lay in Marie's arms after finding Wyatt dead in his apartment that morning, blood everywhere, wondering who could possibly want to harm him so. And then the memory faded, taking Marie with it. It always ended that way, Marie gone from her life. Sid picked up her purse and turned on her heels. And there's a small space. Sid's phone rang. The, bring, the bright LED screen glowed in the dark of the bedroom, unknown caller. Ordinarily, she wouldn't answer, but at 11.30 at night, that was a very strange time to call someone, unless you really knew them. She reached the phone. Hello? Sydney, it's Lucas Rose. She was instantly awake. Lucas? The sound of his voice unnerved her. Yes, you remember me. Of course. Oh, good. I was afraid you might have forgotten. No. Sid could never forget the Lost Boys. What she'd never understood was that Wyatt had ever counted them among his friends. They couldn't be trusted. How did you find me? An uneasiness stole beneath the quilt and up her spine. She sat up. The registry, the registry book at White Willows. I'm up here now. I'm calling because I saw you visited today and I thought you should know. He died late this afternoon, Sid. The shock was like a wasp's sting. Are you still there? Lucas's voice was a little icy. Yes, I am. But how? Heart attack. No, I mean, why are you there? Miriam at the front desk had said no one visited him anymore. I'm his emergency contact. I've always been his emergency contact. I was on my way to have dinner with him when I got the call. Sid was stunned. She hadn't known that about Lucas, that he was Ned's emergency contact. That meant Lucas had been in touch with him all these years. Of that whole circle of young men, she liked him the least. Everything rolled off him because he had no conscience. Lucas's sigh was audible. I'm sorry to disturb you and break it to you this way, but, well, I thought you'd want to know since you came to see him. Sid ran her hand over the, ex the exposed sheet, now gone cold. Yes, thank you. Why did you come to see him today, can I ask? Sid hesitated. I found out he was there, and I wanted to make amends for some things I said to him that I shouldn't have so long ago. I see. Well, thank you for calling, Lucas. Sid hit end call and tossed the phone onto the quilt. The second hand ticked around the white face of her alarm clock several times before she threw back the covers. The chill in the dark apartment matched the emotional one gripping her as she wrapped herself in an oversized white terry cloth robe and walked down the hall. She went right to her liquor cabinet and reached for one of the bottles of single malt she kept in the back, a dark green bottle with a gold banded yellow label. That was how they came from the single malt society. Simply numbered, no name. Her lifetime membership had been one of the many gifts from Wyatt. The memory of his impish smile as he presented her with her first personal bottle brought back the dull ache, buried as, as it was of still missing him. Happy birthday, kiddo. Welcome to adulthood. She ran her fingers across the embossed 126 before opening the bottle. Pouring a snifter was bittersweet. Ned's death meant that it was over. There was no need to go to the police now with a box of evidence that pointed to him as Wyatt's murderer. She settled onto the upholstered chaise by the French window and gazed down onto the lights of the buildings across the East River. It brought her comfort that Wyatt had ha had a hand in her finding this most perfect apartment, even if he never knew it. The hints of peaty smoke, vanilla, and caramel that her nose detected as she held the glass to her lips turned to embers and blowtorch chocolate on the way down, and she closed her eyes as it warmed her insides. Ned was gone. She wanted to cry for Wyatt and for the lost chance to hold Ned accountable, but nothing came. Oh, good.
little long is good as, as long as it's interesting. <laughs> You got it. Uh, I have to learn I have to relearn this every month. <laughs> um, thank you, Mary Burns. That was good. That was great. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Bill Konigsberg. Bill is the award-winning author of seven young adult novels, including Openly Straight, The Porcupine of Truth, and Destination Unknown. His works have been translated into 10 languages. And he has achieved the rare trifecta of a Lambda Literary Award, Stonewall Book Award, and Glad Media Award. Something to missing, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bill lives in Phoenix. He's a native New Yorker, and tonight, and this is this is great because we're gonna we, we're actually twice tonight. We're gonna hear new stuff that's never been read before. Um, but tonight. Bill, for the first time, will read from what he hopes will be his first of many adult literary novels. And Bill, before you read, though, one thing is not here, but there's also a Young Adult Writing Award named after you now, is there not? There is. So, I mean, that's like a huge accomplishment. So congratulations on that. Anyway, please welcome, live from Phoenix, Bill Konigsberg. Oh, you're muted. Bill, you're muted. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Perfect. Sorry, I was I'll muting you because I have you two. Oh, oh, nice. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I was muting you because I have two very uh, dis uh, discontented labradoodles. Uh, we're sad <laughs> because my husband is away for a few days. Um, Anyway, I will try to keep the barking to a minimum, uh, but no promises. Well, I mean, I guess the prom I won't bark. That's the one promise. I <laughs> um, so anyhow, uh, as Rob said, I am uh, to this point known for my young adult books. Uh, I've enjoyed a 15 year career writing for LGBTQ youth, uh, Q plus youth, excuse me, but I'm transitioning now to a new career, hopefully. Uh, I've apparently reached literary puberty. Uh, <laughs> uh, has just come out, uh, sent out my first adult literary novel, which is called Cage Free. Cage Free is a middle age coming of age story about a gay New Yorker with a horrible egg phobia who, two weeks before his 50th birthday, walks in on his much older partner of 25 years having. Uh, relations with another septuagenarian who looks like Santa Claus. Um, they break up, and Kurt, having been in what he thought was a monogamous relationship since the 90s, takes a head-clearing trip uh, to Wilton Manors, uh, where he visits a nude gay men's resort called Palatial Palms that is unfortunately empty. Uh, the owner, though, very kindly offers him a massage, uh, and Kurt's first sexual experience of the new millennium ends with the owner dying on top of him. <laughs> uh, one thing leads to another, and uh, Kurt winds up becoming the new manager of Palatial Palms. It's a comic novel that explores, I guess, mature gay manhood, uh, and I loved writing it. So we'll have to see what happens with the publishing stuff. Anyway, I'm going to read a short scene here that takes place about two months uh, into Kurt's new life. Uh, it's the beginning of summer in Wilton Manors. And if you haven't been there in summer, don't go there in summer. Um, okay. All right. Ah, and suddenly it was more than a month later and Kurt, now a settled resort manager slash citizen of Wilton Manors, was experiencing the peculiarities of a South Florida summer. June in Wilton Manors was simply absurd. A quarter of the population left town, with good reason. The soupy air held you down and the sun blazed right through you, at least when the rain let up. Torrential, world-ending rains that would either leave him feeling mellow and cozy when safely indoors, or apoplectic if for some reason he got caught out in one. The storms dwarfed anything he'd ever experienced in New York. And one June day, he found out what it was like, what it's like when a roof, when the roof at your resort starts leaking during a summer squall. Due to the heat, 
few tourists came through the area because why would they? Among other things, that meant the ramrod could get awkward on Friday nights. Instead of anonymous tourists fucking Fort Bottomdale's best over the pool table, in summer it might be a local guy Kurt always saw stocking up on low-salt Triscuits at Publix, sodomizing Kurt's neighborhood acquaintance Harry, whose poodle Max had once peed on Kurt's leg. Hey, Harry, Kurt said. Hey, Kurt, going to Pablo's pool party tomorrow? Haley, Harry asked, lazily bent over to offer the Triscuits lover easy access to his inner sanctum. Probably, Kurt said, averting his eyes, following unwritten leather bar etiquette. Never look a man in the eye while he's being fucked over a pool table at 1 a.m. <laughs> but still, despite the absurdity of weather and the incestual vibe of what had begun to feel to him like a small village, Kurt had found a groove down in Florida. Kurt was a man with a job that came with a home, two boyfriends, neither of whom requested exclusivity, and two close heterosexual friends. Sally was always good for a cup of tea at her place while their parrots played together. And while summer was too hot for pickleball, Devin and he had standing twice morning, twice weekly morning coffee dates at Storks, where they'd met months ago. Kurt had a randy blue pet, pet blue Amazon, a growing circle of friends, and his life was fuller than it had been in years. There were acquaintances from the bars and gym, and sometimes he found himself lying in bed and counting them, as if the numbers themselves mattered, as if having five friends and 22 acquaintances was somehow meaningful in and of itself. He had never had so many acquaintances. He was bad with names, and they were seemingly all named Jeff or David, so he began to categorize them. He had his political friends, one ultra-liberal, one conservative. This was still Florida, after all. He'd always been to the left himself, but there was something about being accepted by the more conservative that held great sway with him. When it came to coitus, he preferred to take it from the left, a sort of taking one for the revolution, perhaps, and giving it to the right, which was <laughs> the, the man. Nothing in the world was hotter to Kurt than a bent-over Republican. <laughs> he had his dancing friends, the ones he met at Hunter's some Saturday nights to dance his ass off. Kurt was usually assless after about two and a half songs. Fritz is so excited, his dancing friend Remy said. Fritz was the preferred name for his anus. Great, said Kurt. <laughs> I washed him real good. Well, very thankful. He is just raring to go. Kurt said, so your butthole is a he. Remy drew back. Oh my God, don't you just hate those guys who call their butthole she? That is so ridiculous. <laughs> and then there were his young friends, Jackson and Teo. Jackson, black, nerdy, and gay. Teo, Filipino, Filipino, Filipino and boy fluid, which was a term with which Kurt had not been familiar prior to this new chapter in his life. He'd met them on his harrowing 50th birthday night disaster, and they'd become steady Sunday brunch buddies. Even with the heat, they loved to sit outside at apartment 9F on the drive. It was mojitos and pancakes for all. The youngers had long since come to understand that eggs were only okay as ingredients in something else, as long as they didn't look or smell like eggs. And for Jackson and Teo, it was bitchy rejoinders until Kurt put the brakes on. Kids, kids, Kurt said, putting his hand up as a stop sign. No more fighting. Daddy says so. <laughs> Teo and Jackson looked at each other and burst out laughing. Denied, said Teo. You just aren't a daddy. Kurt looked to Jackson for backup. Sorry, you may be older than me, but I'm more of a daddy than you. Teo said, you could never really imagine him like, suck my dick, boy. He took a swig of his minty drink. Jackson cackled, and Kurt bot uh, curled his bottom lip down in an approximation of hurt feelings. This made Jackson laugh harder. That face, yes, that is precisely why you are not my daddy. <laughs> How is that possible? I'm 50. You're not yet 30. I have to have, like, some daddy energy. Maybe stop saying like, was Teo's suggestion. <laughs> Maybe stop dressing like it's 1986 and you're off to summer camp. <laughs> 
advised Jackson, who poured more syrup on his pancakes while ignoring the gawking, gawking stare of an enamored passerby on, along Wilton Drive. Kurt looked down at his outfit, a green Lacoste shirt and tight Levi's. This? This is the problem? Well, it's not the solution, said Teo. <laughs> the solution I can give you. Do you want to know the keys to being a great daddy? Tell me, tell me, Kurt monotoned. This ought to be good, said Jackson. He put his fork down. Teo cleared his throat and began his pronouncement. Lavish praise on the youngsters. Focus all your energy on them. Tell them you're proud of them. Be the kind of dad who says things like, I'm so proud of you, my boy. Ew, said Jackson, <laughs> pretending to stick a finger down his throat. No, I'm serious. Praise and focus. Those are the answers. Well, what if the boys don't deserve praise? What if they're a bunch of spoiled brats? <laughs> Doesn't matter, said Teo. Praise them anyway. I'm so proud of the two of you, Kurt said. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there, said Jackson. I think that's where I'm going to end. Um, thank you for <laughs> uh, allowing me to read. And by the way, I just want to say one other thing, which is that I forgot to mention that Rob Burns was the officiant at my wedding 11 oh. years ago. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Bill. Um, so good to see you again, too, and best to Chuck. Um, oh, very excited about our next reading. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Warnock is an editor, playwright, and gadabout. Um, <laughs> Kathleen founded, and if you haven't been to this, you have to go to it once a month. Kathleen founded her reading series, Drunken Careening Writers that uh, is out of KGB bar uh, on the uh, Lower East Side. Um, she went, oh, 20 years ago, I see now, right? Wow, okay. And her plays have been seen in New York City, regionally and internationally. She's the ambassador of love for North America for the Dublin Gay Theater Festival and associate director for a curation and community for the other side of silence known as Tassos. Um, which is New York City's oldest um, professional LGBTQ theater, which uh, we both are on the board of, by the way, I should full disclosure. Um, but, it, and it's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. You will hear, oh, before I go further, and she's also a member of the Dramatist Guild. Um, before I go further, um, I should probably put a little push in for Tassos because it means a lot to a lot of people in this community. Um, again, 50th anniversary this year in July, going back to the roots with a production of Doric Wilson's Street Theater. Um, so watch your email, uh, watch your publishing triangle, even watch your publishing triangle email, and we'll put information about how you can get tickets to that. Um, Oh, and Kathleen is also the reason I met the legendary um, legendary playwright, Tina Howe. She has invited me numerous times. And once Tina even personally asked me to read a scene from, uh, why am I, oh, The Bald Soprano yes. with her um, at, at Drunken Careening Writers, which wasn't, I don't know, let's just say I've been more embarrassed by things I've done. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, please welcome Kathleen Warnock. Thank you, Rob. That was a very nice introduction. And just to plug my own series, Drunken Careening Writers is the last Tuesday of every month at the KGB bar. And as I like to say, the lovely and fragrant East Village. <laughs> so yesterday, um, I pulled this shirt out of nowhere. Some of you may remember the fabulous bar on the Lower East Side Meow Mix. And I just posted a picture of it, and more than 100 people just sort of fell over it. And it put me on sort of a, oh, remember when, back in the day in the Lower East Side. And so to, when I was picking something to read tonight, I was thinking about that a lot. And uh, my eyes fell upon a short play that I wrote in the aughts uh, that was produced at Metropolitan Playhouse's East Village Chronicles. 
and in which we were asked to write plays about a place or an incident that meant a lot to us on the East Side. So I chose to write about CBGB, where I spent some very late nights, and uh, I chose to include one of my favorite rock stars of all time, Joey Ramone. So I'm going to read to you the short play, which is called All Good Cretans Go to Heaven, and which in fact is in an anthology of the best short plays of sometime back in the aughts. So as you can see, there's a picture of Joey on the front and the characters, well, I'll just read the play and let you hear about it. All good Cretans go to heaven. The cast is Lulu, early 40s, kind of a solid citizen now, still a punk at heart, maybe a tattoo or two, not someone you'd ever see in a business suit. In jeans, work worn, not the expensive kind, work shoes or boots. She has had a lot of fun in her life, not a lot of which she regrets. The other character is Joey Ramone, punk icon, 1951-2001. The time is winter, late 2006, early 2007, late at night, early morning. It's not too cold out, one of the recent New York winters where it's strangely warm at the wrong time. The place is the Bowery, New York City, Joey Ramone place. At Rise, the Bowery, 3 or 4 a.m., even in 2006, not the safest place in New York City. Lulu is coming down the street, projecting a don't fuck with me attitude. She's coming from a party, but she's not too drunk. Sound of something metal and loud, maybe a trash can being thrown or a grate planking down. It makes Lulu start and look around. Lulu, who's there? She looks around, up, spies a street sign. Joey Ramon Place. Turns and looks at a boarded up storefront. CBGB, is that you? She goes up to it and lays her hand on where the door used to be. Damn, fucking old dive. New York fucking city. Joey Ramon, give me strength. She turns to go. Maybe there's a change of light. Joey Ramon is there. Yeah, that Joey Ramon. He's not of this world anymore. And it shows, like maybe there's an unearthly sheen or glow to his leather jacket. Or you could even give him a set of wings. Otherwise, he looks exactly like Joey Ramone, and he's drinking a beer. Joey, hey, what do you want? Lulu, Joey? For real? Joey, I guess. <laughs> Lulu, but you're like, Joey, not living in the same neighborhood, no. <laughs> Lulu, I don't, I don't live around here anymore either, but I'm just over in Astoria. If I can ask, where are you hanging out these days, Joey? Joey, around. I haven't been down this way in a while, but like, if you believe in forever, Lulu, then life is just a one night stand. Is there a rock and roll heaven? Joey looks at the boarded up door and you know we have a hell of a bit. Mm -hmm. Lulu, I would guess. So does that make you like an angel or something? <laughs> Joey, I guess, a Jewish angel. <laughs> Lulu, from Queens, four, five, six, seven. Joey, all good Cretans go to heaven. I didn't sing that one. Lulu, I know that dude. How many times do you think I saw you guys? Not enough, but so Diddy's an angel now too? A rapping junkie angel who made it to heaven? Joey, they have different kind of standards for rock and roll heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnny, did you and Johnny ever make up, Joey? You know, when I was sick, people kept telling Johnny, you don't have forever to make your peace with Joey. But now he does. <laughs> and it's probably gonna take that long. You still play? Joey, all the time, anytime we want, and the sound system never sucks, <laughs> and you never lose your voice. I was walking down the street the other day, Lulu, in heaven. Joey, yeah, in heaven. And I was walking down the street in heaven, and I suddenly saw, it was, I was on the Bowery, and I saw CBGB, and I walked in the door, and it was just like it was. Nearly broke my fucking ankle on a fucking hole in the floor. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, Lulu, what about the bathrooms? Were they still oh. shithole? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Joey, you don't have to piss in heaven. <laughs> a nice touch. <laughs> you should have seen the blowouts they had here, Joey. The last few months, all the people who came together to try and save it. Little Stephen Van Zandt, Joey. I like little Stephen. He's cool. Yeah. A lot of people came and did last shows. I saw Joan Jett in June, Joey. I like Joan. She's cool. Lulu, but they still shut it down. I can't say I was completely bummed. It's time had really come and gone, Joey. Like, mine. Mm -hmm. No way, man. You left way too early. You were young. 
Joey, a lot of younger guys than me in heaven. Hey, let me ask you a question. Sure, anything. Joey, Johnny Heff. The bullies. Yeah, I knew him. Joey, I like him. He's cool. He turned up, didn't want to talk about how he got there. Most I could get out of him was a building fell on him. He was a fireman, you know that? Lulu, yeah. Joey, so like, what happened, do you know? Lulu, okay. She turns toward the spot that is downtown from where she's standing. Look downtown. Joey, what? Lulu, look at the skyline, Joey. Joey, takes him a minute. Hey, I, I don't see that, you know, the two, the twins, the, the world. <laughs> Lulu, that happened after you left town, Joey. You died in the spring. I remember how I heard about it. I was coming home from Easter with my family and on the radio, 1010 Wings, the entertainment world mourns the loss of Joey Ramone. That was April, 2001. I went to your party that year, life sick ass, your bro and your mom. They threw your birthday party at the Hammerstein. Cheap trick, Debbie, Harry, Howie Pyro, those guys. Joey, cheap trick. I like them, they're cool. <laughs> they played Surrender. Good song, Joey. That was May. What about the, the Indicates downtown? You know, I was down there right before. I was running around for Lady Fest East at the Knitting Factory. A lot of girl bands there. Karen Cool, Lord, Sarah Jones. Joey, Karen from Sex Pod. I like her. She's cool. <laughs> Lulu, yeah. I walked out of there about this time in night, <laughs> September 10th, 2001. And I thought, damn, we still got seen downtown, still had its moments. Joe, there will always be downtown. Lulu, but different. Next day, a building. Those buildings. Both of them fell on Johnny and 342 of his brothers. And about 3,000 other people. Joe, you're shitting me. Lulu, wish I was, man. Joey, no way. What the fuck happened? Lulu, I don't like to talk about it, Joey. You got the people like me, and you got the ones who were obsessed with it. It still fucking kills me, so I don't discuss it, okay? Joey, yeah. Whoa. Things have really changed around here, right? Lulu, dude, you do not even know. <laughs> Joey, all the buildings going up. Where, where's the bumps? Where's the kids puking and trying to talk their way in with a fake ID? Lulu, doing it somewhere else, Joey. Just not here anymore. High rises, restaurants. Joey, whoa. Lulu, yeah, sometimes I wonder, is it still New York City? Mm -hmm. Joey, greatest fucking city in the world. <laughs> Lulu, it's different. I mean, things have always changed, but you wonder now if something's gone forever. I wonder if I'm over it, or it's over me. Joey sees the street sign. Joey, Ramon Place? They named this corner after me? Well, they did. Some fans got a petition together, went to the city. I guess the mayor thought it was a good idea. Bloomberg. Joey, <laughs> that's cool. Who's Bloomberg? <laughs> the mayor. Rich guy, a lot of rich guys around now, everywhere. Even around here. I used to come downtown before the Compton Square riots, visit friends in squats that are million dollar condos now. Joey, squats, man, and shooting galleries. Remember those? Ooh, the only galleries around here now sell art. Joey, but you're still here. What do you do? A little, little bit of everything. Run sound, lights for bands, books and rooms. Sometimes I go on tour as a guitar or drum tech. Joey, you still make the music happen. You're still here. Lulu, well, in Astoria. Joey, I like Greek food. You're still here. <laughs> Lulu, I'm still here, Joey. If I need more vocals in the monitor, I look at you and you do it. Lulu, turn it up to 11. Joey, spinal tap. I like those guys. They're cool. <laughs> Lulu, they're, you know, Joey, fictional year. I'm dead, not stupid. <laughs> You're not stupid either. So the Bowery isn't the Bowery anymore. So what? We'll just move along somewhere else, right? There's other places, right? The music never really goes away, right? Lulu, even if the old joint is gone, there's still basements and storefronts and shitty holes in the wall where kids with guitars think they invented punk. And some of them keep the faith and still manage to grow up to be semi-respectable citizens like myself. Joe, don't get too, you know, good or boring. 
<laughs> Don't worry about it, man. I am usually not like this. I'm not going to bitch about how this is like the old days. After all, I'm one lucky joker who got to see you and your brothers play many times and a lot of other bands and some really good ones and some that totally sucked. <laughs> and in that boarded up crap hole right over there, I guess it, I guess it just hit home really tonight. That's why I called you, man, Joey. Okay, well, you know, don't. Don't what, Joe? Don't think it's all in there, man. Just, you know, look for what's there now in the city. It's a wonderful world. You sang the hell out of that song, Joe. Thank you. It's good because it's true, right? Lulu, right. So I guess I'm going to keep on having a good time and see my friends and remember the ones who have gone on and kick ass till it's my time. But I mean, I got it. Like, there's no choice. But I guess there is a choice to fucking like it, like you did. I like you. You're cool. Yeah. <laughs> Lulu. I know. Hey, can I ask you one more question? Sure. You want some of my beer? Lulu. Heavenly Rolling Rock? What's it taste like? The opposite to her, she takes a sip. Heavenly Backwash is more like it. Jeez, Joey, Angel Spit till still tastes like spit. Joey, sorry, man. Lulu, okay. So here's the question. It's more of a favor. Would you and your brothers sing for me, Joey, one more time? Joey, I wish I could do it inside. Me too, Joey. I used to get up on that stage and I'd look out and you'd think you couldn't see anything because of the lights. But you know, you get used to it. I'm sure the shades helped. Joey, they did. And I'd look down that long, long room and I'd see people packed in, standing up on the side and climbing on the speakers and the bartender slamming drinks on the bar and the waitress squeezing through and some guy squeezing them. And at the end of it all, I could see the door. And if I looked harder, you know what I saw? What'd you see, Joey? It was like the back wall was blasted away and I was looking out in the universe. I could see all these fucking stars and galaxies and comets and shit flying across the universe. And it was like I was beaming out the song to the whole fucking universe. That's what I saw in heaven. So now I see these. Lulu. I saw it too, Joey. I'd like to see it one more time. Joey. I can do that. Yeah. Suddenly there is a mic stand doesn't have to have an actual microphone in it. Joey assumes his classic singing position is play-legged, head down, and he begins, one, two, three, four, blackout. And the floor. Brilliant. Um, and, and I should add that even though Kathleen is, of course, a, as you've just seen, an extremely gifted playwright, uh, she's, she's literally, I, I was going to say she's a triple threat, but she's more like, probably more like a quintuple threat for her, her nonfiction. Some of her sports writing, as a matter of fact, is just amazing. So you should follow her on uh, Facebook and, and, uh, you know, just, you know, just in general, be friends with her, <laughs> be friends with all of us. <laughs> um, before we get to our next reader, the, the requisite um, long length lengthy announcements. Um, the um, we have there's a lot going on in the next five weeks. God, Carol, remember I was used to be publishing travel stuff. It was so sleepy. Um, <laughs> we have lots of things going on, so I'm going to quickly run through them. Uh, I promise, only take a few minutes. First on Monday, we will be announcing the finalists for our nine. Um, excuse me, our nine competitive awards and our four uh, special awards, uh, including the the Bill Whitehead Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I know who won. You'll find out. On, you'll find out on Monday. Um, and this will also be our first year with uh, with the Jacqueline Woodson Award for uh, Young Adult and Children's LGBTQ plus literature. So we're really excited about that. Then, on March, this is a non-publishing triangle thing, but there's so many publishing triangle people involved, I should announce it. Next Thursday, March 21, uh, we're going to be, not we, my day job, East Midtown Partnership, is going to be celebrating World Poetry uh, Day 
at the Garden at 550 Madison Avenue with Dan Meltz, with Emmanuel Xavier, with uh, David Groff, with Tim Stobierski, uh, and other, uh, Wo Chan. Um, I mean, it's just, a, a, there'll be a, a total of nine, right, uh, nine poets that'll read between noon and two. Um, so stay tuned. Then we're all going to go to Saints and Sinners down in New Orleans for a few days, including Carol and who else is going down? Yeah, you're going down, Dan, and uh, no Cheryl this year, but there'll be, but you know, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll hear more about those shenanigans. Then, though, um, there's a little break. And then our finalists read, we, we will, like I said, we're announcing the finalists next coming Monday. Then on Monday, April 15th and Tuesday, April 16th, we will be hosting our, I think, I want to say something like 10th annual uh, finalist readings for two nights. So finalists from all our competitive categories will be in here to read. Uh, so you can be here, please be here, but you can also watch it on YouTube. If you... And, um, but I mean, these are going to be the best of the best for those two nights, followed, of course, on Wednesday, April 17th, by the award ceremony themselves, the big event hosted by our board member and our friend, Emmanuel Xavier. Um, we will be at the new school at 63 5th Avenue at the corner of 13th Street in the auditorium. There will be a free award ceremony. It happens, free. <laughs> a free reception following the award ceremony. Um, it is open to the public. You are encouraged to come. You do not have to make a reservation. You do not have to buy a multi-hundred dollar ticket. Please just come and celebrate the best queer literature published in 2023. Um, oh, and by the ceremony starts at seven. Um, and hopefully we move it along because last we had kind of an abbreviated reception because we ran long and, um, you know, then kind of everyone had to have a little Dixie cup or something and, and we had to move them out. <laughs> it won't be that bad yet. And I promise. And remember free and any event. Um, and I should also add that among our special guests, and we're going to get the whole roster together, but um, unless something changes, we will have both the legendary Jacqueline Woodson and the legendary Judy Gron present to present the awards in the categories named after them. Um, so we're excited about that. The final thing is that at, at the end of that week, and I still need to talk to you, Greg Newton, um, Rainbow Book Fair will be held in this building uh, in the community center uh, here on uh, 2020. To uh, Saturday in April. Yeah, no, but what's the, <laughs> what's the address though? I'm sorry. Oh, 208 West 13th, 208 West 13th Street and mm -hmm. 7th Avenue in Greenwich Village. Yes. And it will be on, yes, Saturday, um, April 20th. Uh, we will be here. We are doing an event. Uh, we are working, going to work out the parameters um, probably within the next half hour. Um, <laughs> but Judy Gron, we hope to have here celebrating nonfiction. We're nonfiction writers, and we hope to do it in here, and maybe we can do some other stuff. We will talk. Um, and that I'm I'm done. So I've given you enough stuff to do over the next five weeks. Really, I don't want to hear. You've got eh, nothing to do. Um, so, you know, just watch our bulletins. They'll be coming out on a regular basis. You know, not, not so much that you need to unsubscribe. But, um, <laughs> Oh, and then in March, you know, excuse me, in May, on May 15th, we'll be back here, but that's whole nine weeks from now. So, but David Santos Donaldson, Robert Graves, James Pauley, and others will be reading today. So, oh, I brought this up too, by the way, because we're talking about Farrow Grumley Awards. Drapetomania um, by John R. Gordon was absolutely brilliant book. Um, but that's the kind of excellence you get out of the Publishing Triangle Awards. You find all this such good stuff. Um, so, and then, whoops, if I break it, I have to buy it. I already have one. Um, <laughs> our next writer uh, is someone I met last year. I was just mentioned the East Midtown Partnership World Pop World Poetry Day um, readings that will be taking place next Thursday, the 21st. Um, 
Tim, I don't even know how exactly. I I think friends of a friends passed on things, and I, it got to Tim Stobierski. Tim came. He did a great job. I invited him back. Uh, in the meantime, his book came out, um, and then it was like blurred by David Groff, and I found out. I you know I don't know, and I found out. Hey, he's like another queer poet. Great. So, <laughs> but um, it, and his books are here, by the way, for sale. I just you know point that out. But um, I am really thrilled, though, that Tim will be reading tonight and again at World Poetry Day a week from tomorrow. Um, Tim Stobierski writes about relationships. His work explores the themes of lust, love, longing, and loss presented through the lens of his own experiences as a queer man. His first book of poems, again, Dance Hall, was published by Antrim House Books in July of 2023. Uh, so please welcome Tim Stobierski. Hi. Uh, so Dance Hall is a collection of 60 poems split into uh, five sections that roughly correlate with different phases of our relationship. Um, I thought I would read a few poems from each of those sections, and then um, if it's okay with Rob, something that's not in the book. Oh, just one note. A lot of the poems, the first line is also the title. So if you're confused, that's yeah. that's why. <laughs> just as sparrows in an eclipse will descend from the sky and land in the brush, unsure if it is dusk or dawn. The first time I saw you, my heart fell at your feet. You scooped it up in your hands and cleared away the strands of grass you had collected on the ground. And though you could have kept it for an eternity or more, you held it for just a moment before uncupping your hands so it could resume its flight. And like a word, I ache to be spoken, to cling to your lip and fall from your tongue, to crack in your voice and catch in your throat. Speak me into being. A lot of the poems are short. <laughs> So I'll get through it. I won't, I'll try not to read all of <laughs> Scarborough unfolds its grass-lined shore through breaking waves southwest toward Old Orchard and beyond. The setting sun drips slowly toward the sea, molten copper speck bleeding to be quenched. I have walked this beach. I have watched this sun. I have felt this bleeding, but you here now, this is new. Ours was not love at first sight. It was a moonless August night, stars and stars and stars in their relentless swirl. One sudden flashing streak, stars. A second, brighter, longer, stars. A peripheral third, barely there at all. Stars. Then all at once, that perceived rush. No one too young here. Okay, I'm going to read some spike. <laughs> uh, I, I, I tend to cut these out if, if there's youth in the audience. Uh, this is the, the, what the, the poem the book is named after. Dance Hall. The Lord, he dances on my tongue in rhinestone tap shoes, his footfalls keeping beat alongside my heart when my heart grazes the space between your lips, when my tongue grazes the space between your lips. He sings back up in my fingertips, thick cellist notes so crucial to the composition, his voice a perfumed smoke when my fingertips land on the soft fat of your thighs. He shakes the tambourine beneath my skin an old dance hall tune my father learned from his sister's boyfriend one sticky summer in Harlem, when my skin has had its fill and aches for calm. Dance, Lord, sing, Lord, shake, Lord, and at last be still. Dance 
do not temper me in oil as cumin, chili, mustard. I will not sing, I will not dance. I will not unfurl my essence to you in just the right heat. I am already unfurled, unfurling. My hips splayed, my back arched over the white Formica countertop, your hand between my legs. I do not want this heart. I do not want this heart. It has grown teeth. It chews right through itself and spits up blood. I do not want this heart so full of holes. It has forgotten how to quicken, beat. I do not want this heart, this raging, feeble heart. I do not want this heart. I do not want this heart. And yet this heart is mine damned heart to still be mine. I'll just do two more uh, that I consider to be sort of uh, sister poems um, in the book. So the first is actually on the back. Um, actually, no, the second is on the back. So let me find the first. The first is Crease. If I am too much to hold, hold me in half so I'll fit in your arms. I've been creased before. It doesn't hurt, I promise, nearly as much as you would think. And then, panty. When I feel your palm expansive on my thigh, I become sweet grass. Harvest me by the handful. Tear me out of the black earth. I am yours, as much as you can hold. Um, and then, so, what I, this poem's a slightly longer poem, um, and I've been trying really hard to be able to recite it without reading it. Um, so if I stumble, I apologize, but this feels like the right audience to workshop it in front of. Um, there you go. <laughs> and it's, it's titled Bad Gay. <laughs> Bad Gay. And starved, I chew prep and Viagra on my way out the door to meet a man whose face I've not yet seen, but he called me pretty and my mouth began to water. He knows that if he calls me pretty again, he could have it all, anything he wants, and I know it too. I have not lived a hard life. I did not have to watch friends. I, I did not have to throw bricks at cops merely to exist or watch friends waste away in hospital beds for having love. No pink triangle on my chest. Where's my excuse? Who do I blame when I go out and fuck old men who have hard lives? Let some father have me after dropping his daughter off at school. Strange fingers, strange Tongues, strange cocks inside me. I've become the thing my grandfather always accused me of. Pansy, fairy, cocksucker, and worse. What did he see in that fat little boy? What seed did he imagine sprouting that he could rip out, root and all? He failed, but he was right. I suck cocks with the best of them. Make men no God, as I catch their seed on my lips and on my chest. And imagine, once they've left, a few ounces lighter, and I'm lying there covered in their glory, I have the audacity to whine about my skin and about my hair and the fat on my back and the fact that nobody loves me. My mother loves me, and I despise her for it. Thank you. One of the thrilling things of the Outspoken series since last, uh, since we launched it last June, 
is the ability to hear from writers on their way up. And Tim, you are on your way up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was great. Um, next up is another another zoomed in participant. I think I don't see. I still see Bill here. <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> is Jerry there? Still? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay then. Uh, Jerry L. Wheeler is the editor of seven anthologies of gay erotica for Bold Strokes Books, Wild City Press, and other publishers. His own collection of short fictions and essays, Strawberries and Other Erotic Fruits, was shortlisted for the Lambda Literary Award in 20, excuse, yeah, in 2012. His first novel, Pangs, was released by Queer Space Rebel Satori Press in 2022. And he is the author of the forthcoming The Dead Book, coming out in March 2024. He lives, but wait, Jerry's title is not that right. Just keep going, Rob. Keep going. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll explain. <laughs> okay. And he lives and writes in Denver, Colorado, maintaining his review blog out in print, which I hope you're all reading. Uh, it's 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 like a weekly. It's you know, look, it, there's really no reviews left besides Jerry's now. Um, so <laughs> provide a valuable service. I'm sorry, it was very editorial of me. <laughs> Anyway, his review blog, Out in Print, Queer Book Reviews, and his own editing business, Write and Shine. Um, and we're thrilled to have him here. And, I, and Oh, and also, we're going to be hearing for the first time, I believe this is the first reading for your piece, too, right? Yep, so I think we've got new stuff from Bill Konigsberg and new stuff from Jerry L. Wheeler. This kind of is like a, a great evening in, in literary history. <laughs> so take it away, Jerry Wheeler. Thank you. Um, the Dead Book was what um, actually turned into the new book, which is called Mercedes General. I don't know if you can, well, kind of. this blurred background is uh, <laughs> that. Uh, we'll, we'll skip the cover. <laughs> you follow me on Facebook, you've probably seen it already. Um, and Mercedes General is a collection of short stories about the deaths in the lives of a couple named Kent and Spencer. Kent is a writer. Spencer is an architect. Mercedes General is the title story of the collection. And it's about an AIDS hospice that they inadvertently back into opening. Um, and then the media finds out about it, and there are protesters across the street from their four-story brownstone in New York City on the Upper West Side. So this is a, this is a piece from Mercedes General. Kent is upstairs uh, in his office. Um, there are some other people downstairs who you'll be introduced to very quickly. Um, I'll just start. I tried to get some writing done, but Armand was restless across the hall. I could hear his floorboards creaking as he paced, and I figured he was probably missing Thomas, not that Thomas had ever been conscious. As he did at least once every day for some reason, he stuck his head in my office. Does my mom call today? Always the same question. I don't think so, Armand. You want me to check the messages? He seemed to consider this for a moment. No, it's okay, he said. I'd know. And then he went back to his room. I had no idea how he'd know, but I also had no doubt he would. Armand always seemed otherworldly to me. He was tall and almost skeletally thin due to his illness, his hair shorn close enough to see the lesions on his scalp. His deep blue, almost violet eyes masked what felt like a preternatural intuition of unknown origin. He floated around the house, his lanky arrival never heralded by the sound of footsteps. He'd simply appear, inquisitive yet all-knowing, and usually asking a question. He looked in my doorway once again. Could you get them to stop making noise? Who? 
The people outside. I wish I could. If you want, Miss Lee probably has some spare earplugs so they don't bother you as much if you wanted to read or something. He scrunched up his nose. I'd still feel him out there. Thanks anyway. And he was gone again. I was actually able to work on the book for an hour or so before I heard Spence and Roddy downstairs. Spence jumped on the phone and from what I could hear was talking to potential clients. I also heard Kevin and Roddy working on sloppy joes and chips for lunch for the guys, chided mildly by Miss Lee for letting her sleep instead of getting her up as instructed. It's amazing how much you can hear when you're trying to avoid writing. <laughs> what I suddenly did not hear was the crowd outside. When I looked out the window, to my surprise, I saw Armand in his slippers and bathrobe out in the 30 degree sunshine, calmly waiting for traffic to clear, and he crossed the street headed directly for the group of protesters. As he approached, they had fallen nearly silent, just watching him. I was torn. Every instinct I had told me to go out and get him, but did I really want to do that? He may have been in our care, but he was hardly a prisoner. Who are we to keep him from expressing any sentiment he may have directly to them? As no one else came rushing out to collect him, either they felt the same way I did or hadn't noticed he was gone. I raced downstairs so I didn't miss anything. Hey, I said, I hit, I said as I hit the first floor and slid into the kitchen. Armand's, we know, Spence said. He and Miss Lee and Kevin and Roddy were all crowded around the kitchen window. He didn't say a word to anybody, Roddy said. He just came down and went out the damn door. Miss Lee clucked her tongue. That poor boy, he'll catch his death without a jacket. He sure shut him up, Kevin said, going back to the stove to serve the sloppy Joe mixture. When Armand hit the other side of the street, he made a beeline for the one van left. Its door was open, and you could see from the signs leaning up against it that that was where the placards were stored. People began shouting at him, but no one touched him. In fact, they shrank back in fear even as they yelled. This was probably the closest many of them had been to a man with AIDS, and they weren't quite sure how to deal with it. He had the element of surprise and was taking advantage of it brilliantly, turning his back on them as he rummaged inside their van. I think he's making his own sign, Spence said. Now that's balls, Roddy said. Sorry, Miss Lee. The crowd got louder, but no closer, as he turned around and displayed his surprisingly firm and solid block printing on the sign that read, Please let us die in peace. Some people shouted, some people snorted, but most people turned to each other in stunned reassurance that this was actually happening. Armand held the placard in front of him as if it were a crucifix, warding off the bystanders as he calmly walked back across the street and sat down on our stoop, holding the sign up for all to see. The reporters adjusted their vantage points, getting various shots of Armand and his sign. And now that he was safely across the street, the jeers and catcalls started in earnest, louder than before. Some even threw rocks. None came very close, but one of the honking cars circled the block and got him with a styrofoam cup of coffee hurled out the driver's side window. Armand wiped his face and the sign with the hem of his robe, but remained sitting there. Miss Lee grabbed my shoulder. We have to get him inside, she said. I opened the door, creating a fresh brouhaha from the crowd. Armand, why don't you come inside? We can hang that out the window if you want. Why, he said, looking genuinely perplexed. They're outside. I couldn't argue with that. But I had an inspiration. Your mother's on the phone. He looked at me with the barest hint of a grin, his hair still wet from the coffee. No, she isn't. Miss Lee knelt down beside him. We're afraid you'll get hurt, she said. Please come inside. He shook his head, a beatific Bartleby. I prefer not to. I could feel the frustration coming off Miss, Wee Miss Lee in waves. She stood up and made herself heard sans bullhorn. You people are vile. Where's your humanity? 
this could be your son. Of the two of them, I thought it best to get Miss Lee back inside before she could aggravate the situation. I was just glad she didn't have her rifle. Yeah. I shoot her in and shut the door. I'll watch him. I don't know what else I can do. Why don't you help Kevin with lunch? Maybe he'll come in after a while. But he didn't. He stayed out there, silent and immovable, all through lunch and dinner both. Only when the protesters called it a day and piled in the van did we hear him come in and close the door behind him. Kevin and Miss Lee were washing dishes and I was drying. He moved slowly, sitting down at the table. Maybe I could get a sandwich, he asked. Sure, Kevin said. Ham, salami? Ham, please. No mustard. Coming right up. For the first time since I'd known her, Miss Lee seemed lost for words. She kept giving him curious glances, but she stopped just shy of asking him about the whole episode. I kept drying dishes, and Kevin made Armand's sandwich. You can take it up to your room if you want, he said, putting the plate in front of him. I'll just eat it here if that's okay. I'm so tired all of a sudden. And then he leaned back in his chair, his head slumping to his chest. Oh my God, Miss Lee said, Armand, are you okay? He didn't answer. Kevin took Armand's hand and checked his pulse, and then he shook his head. Get Dr. Berkowitz. He's gone. Miss Lee gave a small sob, hugged him, and then sat down and cried. His mother? She never did call. Thank you. Jerry Wheeler, remember that book, Mercedes General? Uh, Jerry, I'll get my copy uh, at Saints and Sinners. It is out. Uh, it is out um, March 19th, the day before I leave. Okay. and But it will be down there? Do you it know? will be down there. It will be down okay. there. Okay. Yep. Uh, and, and speaking of Saints and Sinners, by the way, um, we, we are big, of course, supporters of Bureau of General Services Queer Division, and we encourage you to give your to buy your books and give your donations to uh, www.bgsqd.com. Uh, remember, tax deductible. When in New Orleans, <laughs> we support Tubby and Coo's bookstore run by our <laughs> queer friend Candace uh, Huber. So uh, we are uh, we're all about the Indies, and you should be too. Amazon doesn't need your money. We've all <laughs> we've all had to go there at one point. I know, but you know, honestly, we can do better. We 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 need to do better. Otherwise, uh, we're you know we're going to be stuck with only Amazon. So don't don't be that person. Our last reader. I think is there anything I've forgotten now? Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. There is Lucy Sante will be reading next month at Hunter College. Um, watch our next newsletter for information on that. We've been working a lot with Hunter lately, and uh, we don't exactly have a formal collaboration, but uh, we they've been bringing lots of writers in through their creative writing program. Um, so we'll give you more things to fill out your schedule. We don't want you bored more, um, you know, watching, um, Again, watching a roll of reruns of Golden Girls is fine for a while, but you know, <laughs> spread your wings. Our last writer, I'm I'm thrilled, she, and I'm thrilled she's here tonight. I wasn't sure if she was going to be zooming in or to be here in person. She is here in person, but believe me, I'd be thrilled if she was zooming in too. Cheryl Head is an author, television producer, organizer, and former broadcast executive. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's also the author of the award-winning uh, Charlie Mack Motown series, set obviously in Detroit, uh, whose female PI protagonist is queer and black. Cheryl is an Anthony Award nominee, a two-time Lambda Literary Award finalist, a three-time Next Generation Indie Book Award finalist, and winner of the Golden Crown Literary Society's Ann Bannon Popular Choice Award. Most recently, Cheryl's the author of the 2023 novel, Time's Undoing, of which the Boston Globe wrote, Cheryl Head is wrestling with the sins of the past in this dual timeline crime novel. 
Ted is a veteran mystery writer. Time's Undoing, inspired by painful family history, is her finest work, and that's saying a lot. Please welcome Cheryl Head. Sorry, I was getting tangled in my clothing and my purse and all that. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, my life. A very, very smooth <laughs> operator I am on. I'm going to stand, but I need a little push down this way. It's good, I think. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I've been writing a couple of books in the last four years that have been taxing. And so to have fun, I write short stories and I read poetry and I love Jonas. Um, and so I thought tonight I'd write, uh, read one of my short stories. Um, I truncated it. Uh, this, this short story I uh, uh, submitted to the Writer's Digest short fiction contest a couple years ago, and I got an honorable mention, and I thought, yeah, I'll read this one tonight. I've cut it way back, so it's only about eight minutes, and it's uh, about the, a, dis a dysfunctional family. I write a lot about dysfunctional families. It's called Special Occasions. It took a long time for me to commit to someone. A few women made the effort to get a rise out of me. One or two more, one or two were successful, but like a James Bond martini, I was shaken, not stirred. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was the therapy, the self-confidence that comes with being in my thirties. But one night, as Amber and I lay entwined after an evening of weed and sex, she asked me to marry her. And I said, yes. Today is our daughter Emily's 10th birthday and I'm in the shower. That's where I do most of my crying. Amy pokes her head in the door. You've been showering for 30 minutes. <laughs> You're timing me? She closes the toilet lid and perches there. I sit on the tub, our knees touch. What's wrong, Jody? You thinking about that birthday again? Three weeks before I turned 10, my mother announced I would have an aquatic theme celebration. The key to a theme party, she said, is to have just the right details. And she piled us into our 1994 Plymouth Voyager for the one hour drive from Wilmington to the shore. While the other kids splashed in the polluted water and shaped sand into forts and castles, my eight-year-old brother Glenn and I walked the beach looking for round shells about the size of a quarter with a hint of pink and yellow. This is for girls, Glenn complained. I wanna go swimming. I wanna help with your shitty old party. Then he dropped his plastic pail and bolted toward the water. I shuddered as his khakis got soaked to the knees. He waved at me with a huge grin that reminded me of dad. Mom would need to be managed. She eyed Glenn. How did you get your pants wet? He inched closer to me. It's my fault, I lied. I led him too close to the water. Glenn and I both held our breath. Sometimes when things didn't go as planned, mom's disappointment was accompanied by a hard slap. Her mouth twitched. My brother trembled under my arm. I prayed, my gaze seemed contrite rather than insolent. Finally, she shook her head. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. I could recall a time when mom was fun to be around. We had winter picnics on our living room rug, sitting atop red checkered tablecloths, munching on spam sandwiches and lemonade, and whacking the plastic ants she purchased at a downtown. Not, not really uh -huh. She used to love to dance, and I admire the way she and dad bopped along to his jazz records. They'd laugh when I tried to mimic their moves and mom would clap when dad lifted me onto his feet and spun me around. But everything changed after he left. Nana lived in Philadelphia, so only Glenn and I witnessed my mother's daily unraveling. It started with the sounds of her sobbing at night followed by breakfast served with red eyes and sullenness. Then she became obsessed with always giving the appearance that we're still a happy family. That's when we stopped having fun and began to have special occasions. As my birthday drew near, mom became more anxious and so did I. The morning of the party, she woke me at seven wearing the clothes she'd worn the day before, her eyes red and unblinking. Make cereal and toast for you and your brother. Her voice was shrill and she punctuated each word with moving hands. I left a to-do list on the table and she disappeared into her sewing room. Nana arrived early to help with the chores. We hung blue and green crepe paper and luminescent beads on the walls and taped construction paper fish and seahorses onto crinkled stream streamers. Our table centerpiece was a crystal bowl filled with blue marbles and the seashells we harvested. But, mom, most, but mom's mostly notable creation 
was a surprise for me. She emerged from the sewing room holding an elaborate costume. I was to preside over my party as a mermaid, mm -hmm. complete with a sea green tank top, blue slippers, and a huge paper mache fishtail with two slits from which my skinny legs protruded. When I put on the green tights and stepped into the tail, Glenn collapsed to the floor in uncontrollable laughter. Tears streaming down my face, I rushed to the sanctuary of my bedroom, the fish tail swinging wildly behind me. Nana followed. Jody, I want you to listen. Your mother worked for two weeks on that costume. Look how beautiful the color is and how carefully she sewn the sequins and mother of pearl buttons into the fabric. I stared at the tail, my blurred vision adding a weird authenticity to the sea creature appendage. The mermaid tail was a work of art, but also an invitation for ridicule by fifth graders whose only expectations of a birthday party were cake, ice cream, and pin the tail on the donkey. As I predicted, I was teased unmercifully by my, pa my party guests, but as it turned out, much less so than Glenn. What my brother hadn't realized as he delighted in my predicament was his role in mother's oceanic extravaganza. He was to be Poseidon. <laughs> she fashioned a flowing white skirt and coated a pair of sandals in gold paint and insisted Glenn wear the foil crown and matching harpoon she crafted. <laughs> the party goers scoffed at the nautical theme and disrespected the decorations. <laughs> they bumped against the walls, tearing crepe paper and sending beads bouncing across the floor Parents were in perpetual motion, emptying marbles from the children's pockets. And worst of all, some of the boys repeatedly tortured Glenn by crawling on the floor to look under his skirt. <laughs> 20 minutes into the party, Glenn escaped out the back door and mom lost it. Nana cut the festivities short, sending everyone home with apologies and huge slices of birthday cake. By the time a cop knocked on our door with my brother in tow, mom was hysterical. Don't you know I've been worried sick about you? She stood unsteadily, her mascara sprinkling down her face as she began to focus on Glenn's attire. By means of theft or the kindness of strangers toward a half-naked boy, Glenn wore a pair of rolled-up jeans, flip-flops, and an oversized t-shirt emblazoned with the message, Italian men do it better. <laughs> Where did you get those clothes? Mom lunged and tore his shirt. The officer held her back with one hand and pulled my brother behind with the other. Is everything gonna be okay here, ma'am? The police asked Nana. She nodded and led mom to her bedroom. I gave Glenn a long hug. He wouldn't tell me where he'd been that afternoon, nor what had become of his Poseidon garb. When he fell asleep at the dining room table, I carried him to his room and then sat alone among the ruins of my party. A few months later, Glenn and I went to live with Nana who said mom was getting the care she needed to get well. I was a good student and after graduating from high school, I went to college. Glenn didn't adjust as well. He continued fighting in school and was expelled several times. Although I have no real proof, I always believe that disastrous 10th birthday party might mark my brother's pitiable slide into juvenile delinquency, drug use, and felony crimes. The finishing touches on Emily's party are complete. Amber's picking up three pizzas and in an hour will be overrun by giggling girls impatient to be teenagers, but still young enough to believe in dragons and princess brides. Tomorrow I'll pick up mom so she can have breakfast with us. She lives nearby in a facility where she's as normal as the other old women around her. She'll ask, as she always does, if I've seen Glenn. I visit my brother at Bayside Prison only two or three times a year, but whenever I do see him, at some point during our time together, he puts on a wicked smile and asks the question, had any good seafood lately? Uh, <laughs> was wrong again. Thank you, Cheryl Head. That was wonderful. Um, so glad to have you here with us. And that's our program, except for wait, little house have to end with housekeeping. Remember, if you can become a member of the Publishing Triangle, visit publishingtriangle.org, $40 a year. It's not tax deductible, I have to admit. We're a 501c6, but um, nevertheless, let me, for, let, do I have to, uh, do the, my Sally Struthers thing again? Less than a dollar a week, and you <laughs> can do so much to help promote queer literature. And if you want to volunteer some of your time, 
I think I could speak for Carol, Joe, uh, Jim, and other members of the of the steering committee and say, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Greg Newton, and also thank you, Donnie Jokum from the uh, Bureau of General Services Square Division for hosting us once again. We are thrilled with this collaboration. Uh, and that your donation there is tax deductible, remember. <laughs> and also, your books are not, but still shop here and then donate also. Um, you're going to support a great resource for queer literature in New York City when you do that. Um, and if you're not in New York City, Jerry, uh, Bill, I don't have to tell you this, support your locals uh, where you are. Um, and finally, remember, especially all the things that are coming up, if you're not on our mailing list, please make sure you are. But especially that third week of April, April 15th and 16th, our readings here with our finalists for our nine prestigious awards, and they are prestigious, let's just be honest, right? among the most prestigious in literature, period, let alone queer literature. On Wednesday, April 17th, our the Publishing Triangle Award Ceremony, our 36th year, once again for 36 years, a ceremony and a reception that are free. Uh, that means there's not specially cocktails, okay? But there's gonna be... <laughs> There's going to be wine and beer and decent food. You'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be fine. And you'll be entertained and enlightened. And I can guarantee you, there's going to be some really kick-ass people that are going to be present and receiving awards and giving out the awards. Um, and then on the 20th, the April, or the, um, the, the Rainbow Book Fair uh, stuff, the details to be uh, finalized, but it's going to be great. And there's going to be so much all the stuff going on in this building. You want to be here for that. All your favorite writers and publishing industry insiders are going to be here that day. Um, so, okay. Thank you, Stephen Greco. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Wait, wait before I do that, look. Pass these around. Pass those around again, please. I've been sitting there eating them. <laughs> Last <laughs> night, I stepped on the scale and I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, I I like try to remember my my new my my Noom app uh, password again. <laughs> I'm like I got I did this I, I lost 20 pounds this way before I can lose the 27 now again. <laughs> um, but and then of course I come here and I'm just like sitting here eating chocolate. <laughs> I'm like I am my own caricature. <laughs> but thank you, Stephen Greco, Mary Burns, Bill Konigsberg, Kathleen Warnock. That's where I thought. <laughs> Tim Sobierski. And remember, Tim is going to be reading poetry next week. Jerry L. Wheeler and Cheryl had for a wonderful night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Greg. I got it. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Good night, folks.